Hello and welcome to episode 36 of The Garden Log, coming to you from late July 2018. My name is Ben Dark and I am a gardener. And for you this week, I have been gardening. I wouldn't do it otherwise. I need to come back here and make sure that I have a collection of anecdotes. So each morning I strap on my secateurs and head out in search of the novel. This week I am talking Crocosmia. You might know them as Mombrisha but they have been called Crocosmia now for a good 10 years, so maybe maybe it's time to start calling them Crocosmia. I'll also be talking about sedums, and it's definitely not time to start calling sedums Hylotelephium, because that's, that's too new. But I will be talking about those, and I'm also talking about cooch grass, and how to deal with that, and when to deal with that, and how to create a suitable atmosphere for dealing with that. And then the main event, the centrepiece of this week's podcast, is an arduous cut of the hay meadow, complete with wasp stings, torrents of sweat, and quite possibly heat stroke. That's all coming up in the week in gardening. So enough of this blather, let's get on and listen to it. Welcome to The Week in Gardening. Sometimes I think this podcast needs a previously on the garden log section, somewhere where I can recap the main thesis of the podcast and outline the events that led me to this position in life and in horticulture. I won't go into everything from the very beginning, but I will say that in May 2017, I took a job briefed with transforming a garden from a nice garden into a magnificent garden. I set about this with vigour and gusto and quite a lot of thoughtful consideration. It's now well underway. I've been buying new plants, moving things around, hiring people. And this is the, the overarching narrative of my job and of this podcast. But within the narrative, there are smaller subplots. And one of those subplots came to a crescendo last week with the garden party. That is now out of the way. The energy levels in the garden can return to more of a, a baseline thrum than their, their trilling pitches they were at before. And I think that we all felt this coming into work on Monday morning. It felt almost like the first day of a new term. We didn't have to worry about exams anymore. The exam was out of the way. We all passed with flying colours. In which case, what's the point of the exam? Someone's got to fail, surely. Anyway, we passed. And now it's time to start thinking of the longer term again, to put our heads back on to three years, five years, ten years plans. And so on Monday, we, we considered. I started thinking again about what I'm going to do for for the meadows, the trees, the, the longer term views out of the garden. And I did all of this while watering, because it is still as hot as some part of the devil's anatomy. The garden itself is looking very midsummer. The, the Crocosmia has absolutely erupted. The Crocosmia lucifer, which fits with the devil's anatomy quite well. And it's, it's a lovely, lovely plant when it's out in flower like this, because it seems to hang around the, the other plants, bringing that sort of orange fight and fire but still still being dainty and delicate sometimes orange flowers look fussy and and frumpy and like a like a rather overdressed circus clown but these ones not at all not a bit of it one of the reasons they were looking so good is that we went through before the garden party and took out every single brown leaf because cosmia particularly in the in the hotter summers tends to go brown on about one in four of its of its strappy pointed leaves and there's still flower but but it looks slightly less than perfect and when we are creating the illusion of a well-watered oasis a, a refuge a, a place to get away from the heat we don't want brown leaves reminding the guests that that they too are are mortal like the plants 
So they're out and looking very good. I'm also really enjoying the, the plants that used to be known as the sedum, but which are now known as hylotelephium and the hylotelephium spectabile particularly. That's that wonderful big ice plant, the thing that grows to about four foot tall if it's really happy, with the, the big purpley pinky heads of, of flower, and they flop everywhere. Fantastic floppers if you don't keep them well constrained. And the reason why I like them at this very week of the year is that they haven't turned pink yet. The flowers are still white, and they are that sort of that sort of whitey green, like the flowers of something like hydrangea limelight, just before hydrangea limelight's at its full opening. And these in our garden, the sedum stand up very tall because we support them with those wonderfully expensive plant supports. Do you know the ones? They are a circle of curving metal bars with a rounded top on them and they they're produced by all sorts of quality ironmongers they look like a giant crown so when you have the border just starting to grow when the plants are only two inches tall and you're putting your staking in place it looks like you've plonked some vast crowns across your your garden maybe like there's a chess set that has been covered by silt and it's a giant chess set by the way and only the crowns remain those have now been completely swallowed by the plants, but the plants are held completely upright in them. And to me, they look like, like these plants are jellyfish rising from the deep, like the, the flower head is the, the dome of the jellyfish, and then the, the straight stem with all of those round leaves coming off the side of it is like a, a trail of bubbles left in the wake of this ascending blob of sea matter. It's a very exciting stage for me, and in two weeks' time it'll be ruined, I think, because they'll start turning pink, and I find that slightly less exciting. You, of course, will have completely different opinions, and that's why gardening is so wonderful. So that was Monday, a new term day of watering, of thinking, of planning and plotting. It was good to have this day of gentle repose, because... I was well aware that later in the week things were going to get very hot and very heavy indeed. But more of that later. On Tuesday I settled down for some good old-fashioned weeding. And weeding is not something that I talk about very often on this podcast. Mainly because I try not to let the beds get to the stage where they need weeding. We have enough presence in the garden and enough people in the cultivated areas that you can generally get to something before the stage where you need to dedicate an afternoon to an area when i'm doing my little contemplative wonders when i'm thinking about which plants look most like jellyfish that's when i pluck out any weeds that i might see but there was a bed that had been allowed to fill itself with cooch grass and anyone who knows grass, they know it's a, a, a lover of disturbed ground. This is a bed that was put in place just when I came into the gardens and then really hasn't had much done with it. It's got some bulbs in it. It's got lots of anemone bulbs uh, carrying on the sea theme. Actually, they look really good still. Even at this time of the year, they're still throwing up some flowers. The bluish anemones are chucking up flowers still. But the rest of it's got lots of grass in it. So I got down to digging that out. And I don't know how many of you listen to this podcast while you are gardening. There's a, there's a split within the gardening world, from what I can tell, between almost the sonic purists, the people who want to be present and in the moment, and who want to experience every bit of, of birdsong and raindrop patter, and those who want to take themselves away to, to other places to, to learn and to experience new worlds. And neither of them are right, and neither of them are wrong. I tend to do bits of both. Sometimes I, I weed in silence, uh, with only me, my thoughts, and the natural world. Sometimes I weed with the soundtrack of creeping, dreadful horror, as I did this week. I was listening to some, some stories, basically based around the H.P. Lovecraft stories, these cosmic horror tales. I listened to them all afternoon while weeding out this cooch grass, which is quite fitting because cooch grass has quite horrific roots. 
It's got roots that worm and wiggle, and a kind of pale and pallid and flabbyish, which which fits with some of the stories. So I wondered if it's possible that now, every time I return to this bed, if I listen to horrific, spine-chilling horror tales, then maybe it will engender an instinctive reaction in me when every time I pass I feel a, a creeping sense of unease. It's going to be an ongoing experiment of which I will appraise you of the results. I have to say this, this couch grass weeding was a matter of some importance because it had grown from its original infestation, I don't know where it came from, into a sizable colony and the colony was making threatening movements towards the lawn. And in this section, the lawn is newly laid turf, pristine and almost monocultural. And I really didn't want an infestation of cooch grass within the lawn because you can't really do much about it. Even if you're using weed killers, you can't selectively weed killer it out because it's a grass as well as all the other grasses. If it really takes hold in a lawn, you either accept that you've got a cooch grassy lawn and nothing particularly wrong with that, or you spray it off dig it out and start again. I am fine with couch grass. Maybe other people aren't. It's probably best that I don't let it take over the garden. If you're wondering if a grass in your garden is couch grass, then just have a wheedle around with a fork. And if you uncover a nest of thick worm-like roots, then you can be certain that yes, you do have couch grass and get that stuff out of there. Don't put it on your compost heap either. So that was Tuesday, a day of enjoyingly scaring myself. I have to say it's very strange listening to these tales of rain and mud in what was one of the hottest days of the year up to that point. Though it wasn't nearly as hot as Wednesday, nor Thursday. And Wednesday and Thursday were the days that I had chosen to do the hay cut in the meadow. Poldark fans will be disappointed to learn that I did not do this topless and with a scythe, I did it with a power scythe, or an allen mower, as it's sometimes called. And an allen scythe, or power scythe, or allen mower, is a very fearsome beast indeed. It is like, the, the, the cutting action is essentially that of a hedge cutter. If you can imagine a vastly bigger hedge cutter, with teeth five times the size of a hedge cutter teeth, positioned low down on the ground in front of a giant great big engine with two wheels attached and a gardener attached behind that. It looks to me like a shark has been crossed with a crocodile and then then someone has seen that shark crocodile monstrous hybrid and thought I'm going to build a robot of that thing and they've done that and then hired it out to gardeners to cut their meadows. The reason we're using this contraption is we want the grass to be cut intact, as it were, sliced cleanly at the bottom so that we can rake it up and cart it away from the meadow. The idea is to reduce the fertility of the ground. We want to take away all of this biofuel each year so the soil is increasingly impoverished, allowing wildflowers to start competing with grasses. It's a, a very long-term management strategy. It's also incredibly hard work. The The power scythe takes a, a very strong arm. You have to wrestle it to keep it on the ground because it wants to ride up over the backs of the hummocks of grass. The grass has collapsed into waves, as grass will do if it's been left uncut all summer. And the mower wants to just gently slip itself over their backs. But I need to force it down so that it cuts them right at the base. And that's hard work. And then the raking itself is back-breaking, back-breaking labour. You can see why the whole village would turn out at the time of the hay cut. And why they'd have to get so riotously drunk afterwards. And doing this on the two hottest days of the year, when Public Health England were advising people to stay out of the sun, and we were doing two full days of labour. Really, this should have been postponed, but the thing is it's so hard to get one of these mowers nowadays. Most of the hire shops have discontinued them, because they are... I was talking to the hire guys about this, why, why I couldn't find one in the four or five different places I, I phoned up. 
And they said it was because the mower is such a shaky, rackety, powerful thing. It's got such a weird, unnatural motion with that chatter, 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 sideways action at such great force and rapidity that essentially it shakes itself to pieces after about a day's use. And every time they hire it out, they have to rebuild the thing from the ground up because all the bolts have fallen out and the engine's coming off. So it's not worth their time anymore. So they don't do it. I'd found this, this scythe, I'd booked it months in advance and it had 15 jobs in the queue afterwards because everyone cuts their meadows at the same time. So we couldn't send it back, we had to do it in these two blazing days. And we did. It was long and sweaty and it required cold lemonade and lots of sun cream. But we got all of the grass down and all of the wildflowers that lay within that grass. I had to say this year hasn't been particularly good for wildflowers. You'll remember if you've listened to episode, I think episode two probably, I was talking about all the wildflower plug plants I put in. Not many of them worked. The the knapweed worked very well. There's lots of knapweed in there now. And then there is lots of vetch as well. That worked. But not really. I, I didn't see any of the leucanthemum. I didn't see any of the, well, various other things. The, the meadow buttercup worked, actually. The little wild crane's bill seems to have disappeared entirely. There are other wildflowers in there already. There's lots of bird's foot trefoil, and there's things like gallium verum. But we need more. There's also some yellow rattle I saw for the first time. Didn't see it in flower, but I found the rattle at like seed heads. And yellow rattle is that plant beloved of meadow makers because it's semi-parasitic and it's supposed to help weaken the grass alongside our our cut and rake off job. I'll get some more seeds of that for for next year. The idea is now that the meadow is cut down, we keep it cut, cut, cut until it looks like the weather's going to get a bit more soggy and then we will lay down a load of seed, of wildflower seeds, and see how that goes. Some of the highlights of the meadow cut included me driving the tractor, which we were using to pull up the the various hay bales that we were making, me driving the tractor over a wasp nest, and then my colleague walking through it and getting horribly stung. That was pretty awful. Another highlight, I suppose, was that the mower didn't shake itself to pieces, which it did last year when I was doing this cut, and also that we didn't do any damage to any wildlife. Unfortunately, last year doing this, the grass was a lot wetter, and... I found some frogs in there. There were no frogs this time, which could be a worry in itself. Maybe we 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 just didn't get frogs to this stage of the year this year. We finished the day on Thursday with all of the hay cut and most of it collected, probably about a third of the field left, which is still actually quite a lot of work to do. And we left it there. That was that was enough. I won't come back for another week, and I'm hoping by then it has been sucked up by a tornado. So that left us with Friday, and I returned to more delicate matters. We cut the lawns, and edged the lawns, and I cut lots and lots of dahlias for the house. Loads of single-flowered dahlias from the Bishop series, the the Honker dahlia, that star-shaped strange little one, and Downham Royal, a purple pom-pom dahlia, just making really hot, loud, vibrant bouquets. It's almost impossible to go wrong with a vase full of dahlias, whatever type you have. They just go with each other so well, and they they cause a smile. So that was a very pleasing job to get over the the hell of the hay cut. And I went home. And on the way home, on my cycle through London, once I'd got the train back into town, it rained. It rained for the first time in forever, and it rained hot and hard and heavy, like a tropical rainstorm. And it rained at the same time as all the plane trees in the park were shedding their bark. As this rain was coming down and these jigsaw pieces of plane tree bark were falling down. And some people were hiding from the rain and others were just out cavorting and dancing in it. And it was, it was very nice. It was, it was exciting. It was also the night of the blood moon. So I think that made people more inclined to cavort wildly. Maybe that's just Fridays generally. I certainly cavorted. But that's not for this podcast. Let's see if we have any horticultural recommendations.
Just a very quick set of recommendations from me this week. I have been continuing my semi-habitual troll of the strange gardening films of the internet. I, I found a site called uh, the Huntley Film Archives, which is essentially a, a commercial database of old newsreel and film that they sell to people making documentaries and things. But all of the films on there are available to view without a fee. You just get a watermark on there. And if you go onto the Huntley Film Archives website, that's huntleyarchives.com, and search gardening, you get the most bizarre array of clips. I've only looked at about 2% of them, and already I've seen clips from County Durham, from County Durham's tidiest coal mine in the 1960s, about what their, their ex-miner gardener gets up to driving around there. I've seen a wonderful sort of propaganda film, again from the 60s, maybe late 50s, from New Zealand, which seems to be getting everyone to want to move to New Zealand by talking about how wonderful the climate is for flower growing. And they make lots of smug remarks like, some people garden on balconies, but here nearly everybody has their own house. And they talk about the wonderful plants they can grow. I've seen a tour of Wisley from the 1970s with everyone smoking cigarettes and wearing flares and very long coats and wandering around bending down to look at the flowers. There's some strange stuff on there, uh, a silent film of a man in a park in Cardiff digging a hole, but uh, that's, that's fascinating in its own right. And if you enjoy this podcast, then maybe you would enjoy Welshman Digs Hole video. Anyway, there's thousands more of those that I haven't gone through yet. So if anyone here is thinking of producing a documentary on the history of gardening, then, then go there. Or if you just want to have a strange and nostalgic look back at the, the gardening of our shared heritage, then go to huntleyfilmarchives.com and search for gardening. Likewise, if you have other interests, uh, no matter how esoteric, I'm sure they have clips to, to satisfy you there as well. Thank you for listening to today's episode. It was produced with the utmost of love and attention, as always. And I I hope that people are enjoying these as much as I'm enjoying making them. I'm certainly seeing the, the swelling numbers of people listening to them, which is which is a pleasure to me. But but remember, more people is always better. So if you have anyone who's vaguely interested in gardening or in, in Welshmen in holes, or in anything at all that, that might be tangentially covered in here, then tap them on the shoulder and say, well, have you heard about this, this new podcast? Then I'll be very grateful to you. Until next week, make sure you all stay well hydrated. I will be out in the garden again next week. But wherever you are, I hope you have a wonderful time. Bye-bye.